with essential resources such as water. Investment in smart cities infrastructure is one of the main topics today. We're going to be talking about this, but not only. We're going to be talking about the trends, the insights, the different approach, and about all those innovative solutions that the region is trying to, to implement. To build more reliable power grids of expand these uh, solutions, we need to simulate as well the, the economic field, but as well the public sector. So with this uh, conversation that we're going to have together with the panelists, we're going to be able to get into that and even deeper into the details. Let's talk about how smart cities are trying to innovate and elevate uh, different poverty aspects and integrate the smart solutions in order to move forward to technology in the frameworks. But before getting into that, I would like to pass the microphone to Federico Gonzalez, who is going to be introducing the work that we do as a chamber and what we offer to all our members and advocates. So please, Federico, the microphone is yours. Thank you, uh, Alejandra. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. I will share my screen with you today to make a short intro about uh, the, the UTEC, the European Technology Chamber. Here we go. Uh, Alejandra, can you tell me if you guys can see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, great, yes, yes. excellent. Well, uh, uh, as I was mentioned, the, the UTEC, the UTEC Chamber is a, a Swiss nonprofit uh, organization. That, that's why we are a little bit different than most of the chambers of commerce that in some way or in the other belong or are related to local or central governments from different countries. We are not, uh, as mentioned, we are a nonprofit organization and that uh, makes us um, uh, a little bit different than many other chambers. This is the structure of our um, uh, chamber. As you can see, we are divided into alliances uh, and uh, uh, we are uh, also divided into regional uh, alliances in where we are uh, focusing on, on different parts of the world. In this case, China, Africa, of course, Latin America and the DAG region uh, in Europe. I, I have to say, I, I told this uh, before uh, to Alejandra and, and, and the rest of the speakers today, China will change into Asia-Pacific Alliance, so we are going to be a little bit more broader uh, in this uh, regard and wider, and we are going to offer solutions and possibilities not only in China, but also in other um, countries of uh, Asia. And then we also have, of course, the core of the uh, Chamber of the Alliances, and in there, as you can see, we are speaking about IoT, we are speaking about energy, and of course, as uh, today's topic, also we have a Smart Cities um, uh, Alliance, uh, also digital transformation, etc. And of course, we are also having our impact alliances in where we are focusing in different uh, topics like SDGs, like climate action, finance, or women in tech, uh, trying to find best ways and best practices in different fields for all of those uh, topics and for our members, of course, from the Chamber. The Chamber, in the Chamber, of course, we are focusing a lot in our events. We are organizing more than 200 webinars like this one uh, per year with over 600 speakers uh, during the whole year, speakers, experts in different fields. We are organizing, or we will organize uh, more than 20 expos per year, hybrid events with people physically joining us, plus the virtual uh, exhibitions and the people also logging uh, online, the ones that cannot uh, attend physically. And we are having over 50,000 registrants every year to our events, to our networking group meetings, to our webinars, in where 90% or over 90% of those uh, people is uh, decision makers of different companies, SMEs, corporates, etc. Uh, if someone uh, or, or the, the thing that the most uh, valuable we do here at the UTEC is the network. I mean, we are uh, a very strong tech network uh, in Europe uh, with over 400 networking uh, uh, meetings per year in where our members have access to the speakers and the panelists in where business opportunities are, are there. Business leads are all, always there for our members joining our uh, networking room meetings, and of course, uh, we are also offering uh, EU projects and funding through the tenders and through 
the, the different programs that we are helping our members to get this chance to get these uh, fundings, uh, public fundings. This is the UTEC ecosystem. In there, you can see our insights uh, with our white papers, position papers, uh, visions for Europe, our magazine, etc. Uh, the programs, uh, UTEC centers uh, in different parts of the world, digital transformation, climate action, etc. And uh, of course, the tech forum our business platform our online business flat platform in where all our members have virtual booths in where we organize our virtual exports in where we have our follower uh, database and the, in where we do almost all uh, our uh, work uh, through this uh, tool because it's very convenient it's very easy to use and it's very helpful for not only for us as a chamber also for our members and also for our followers so that's the short introduction that I wanted to make to you. If you have more uh, questions about the UTEC, if you want to learn more, if you want to become a member of the UTEC, please contact us. You can contact, of course, Alejandra Pulido. You can contact my colleague Marcus or myself, and uh, we will be happy to listen to you, to learn more about your business and activities, and to welcome you in the UTEC uh, to continue making it the number one tech organization in Europe. So, that's it uh, from my side, uh, Alejandra. Uh, I led you with the uh, uh, panel discussion. I wish all of you a very nice webinar. Thank you so much, Federico, for that great music chamber presentation. Now, I would like to invite all the people from the audience to share any comments, any questions that you would like to share with the panelists. And you can do that on the public chat that you will find on the left side of your screen. So I encourage you to start doing that. Please don't wait till the end of the panel. You can start doing it from this moment. Today, we're honored with the presence of three great panelists. All of them are experienced professionals with a great vision. But first of all, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Jorge Vargas. Jorge Vargas has 38 years of professional life with experiences at sea level executive in international companies, such as Engelman and Siemens in Brazil, England, Mexico, Switzerland, Costa Rica, Germany. Jorge Barros has a degree in economics and a postgraduate degree in business management, an MBA in finance and a PhD in international affairs in the in US. He is the author of several lectures, scientific and medical articles published in Brazil and abroad. Jorge Barros is currently the CEO of the Smart City American Institute in Brazil, is the president as well of the Fiducia Dominion Organizational Reengineering and professor at the Getulio Vargas Foundation. Pierre Jorge, the microphone is yours, and when you will finish your keynote speech, I will introduce the other panelists to the audience. Well, first of all, I want to thank Maria Alejandra Pulido and Federico Gonzalez for this invitation. It is an honor for me to be here today speaking at the European Union Tech Chamber. I also would like to greet my colleagues at this event, uh, Alvar Porcona, Gregory Engelbrecht. Uh, it's a pleasure and it's, it's a, pri a privilege for me to share a debate panel with such distinguished experts on this subject. According to the uh, Smart Cities Council report of 20. 2020, 80 percent, I repeat, 80 percent of all smart city projects in the planet fail, and the term smart cities is still X, a universal definition. In Latin America, these numbers, I fear, are even worse. Hello, everyone. My name is George Barros. I'm CEO of the Smart City Business America Institute in Brazil. We are headquartered in Sao Paulo, and we have nine branches from Canada to Argentina. We're very proud to be working for the development of smart cities in the whole American continent, positioned as a platform for consulting, sharing knowledge, discussing building a strategic relationship, and developing business models, all in favor of strengthening the market and creating a robust ecosystem for our cities. First slide, please. So, as I was saying, according to the Smart Cities 
Council report, quote, if not addressed, these gaps can introduce insecurity, unsafety, and privacy risks, including risks to critical infrastructure and its underpinning technologies, unquote. The high percentage of failure and the lack of a correct definition of what are smart cities are closely linked. In the last 10 years, in all my lectures, I always make a point of raising awareness to this issue while I'm trying to correctly guide project developers and municipal managers on how to properly conceptualize, how to plan and how to execute a program of this nature. And listen, although these two are closely linked, closely connected, I will address these two issues separately, okay? Regarding the definition, I carried out a survey among 200 experts on this subject, and I could not find two authors, two single authors, who agreed with the same definition of what a smart city is. But there is an explanation for this. In the recent past, there were two moments, one regarding the translation and the other one regarding the interpretation, which contributed to divert opinions and largely embarrass this concept. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. The first explanation of these divergences takes us to the end of 1980s, when to facilitate and to shorten its writing and pronunciation, the original term is intelligent city, was changed to smart city in the English language. <clears throat> smart, as we know, sometimes means intelligent, indicating the cognitive ability to understand. But in the technological, military, and political fields, the word intelligent is etymologically defined to demonstrate the capacity of interconnecting functions and data to produce information in order to take decisions for decision makings. So a smart city can also be, as we see, but it does not necessarily mean a city that is fancy, high-tech, savvy, elegant, or clever. A smart city is a city where solutions applied to meet exclusively the citizens' needs are interoperable. And because of this connectivity, they produce additional gains in efficiency, economy, and continuity through the intelligence that unites them. We have learned from observation that in order to spoil a project, it's enough to treat it from a purely technocratic point of view, placing technologies as determinants of its success. And by doing this, by doing so, the concept of smart cities will certainly, certainly be wrong, will be negative and undesirable for all people. Next slide, please. Let me give you an example. Recently, Toronto in Canada committed the cardinal sin of carrying out an urban plan, prioritizing the adoption of technologies but forgetting to put people's quality, quality of life as the main goal. There were many planning mistakes there. Excessive electronic surveillance without respecting people's privacy, breaches in cybersecurity, isolated systems without interoperability, and technological solutions that replaced human labor without the care to prepare and train people to take on new tasks. This all ended up causing significant local technological unemployment. The population was not properly involved and it did not participate in the decisions. The city management prioritized the commercial interests of technology suppliers disregarding the population's collective interests. And another component that contributes to the failure of smart city projects is motivation. Yes, motivation. It is necessary to motivate the city management team and the community 
empowering them, allowing them to know and to understand the benefits of smart solutions so they realize the, the, the value gains, the value gains. They have to realize the value gains. And let's remember, qualified teams will understand a modern solution and its limitations, of course, but unqualified teams will normally reject and oppose to any new idea, especially if we're talking about disruptive emerging technologies, right? Uh, on the other hand, there are hundreds of good reasons to celebrate the success of smart city projects in Latin America. Let's see. Next slide, please. Buenos Aires is the first city to have a 100% smart, sustainable, and efficient lighting network. The city government reduced energy and OPEX consumption by 50% optimizing citizens' well-being and safety. Next slide, please. In Montevideo and Canelones in Uruguay, an intelligent traffic management, a garbage solution, and an intelligent parking system achieved a reduction of over 60% in noise pollution, fuel consumption, and CO2 emissions. Next slide, please. Tourism, which represents 12% of GDP in Latin America, is a sector that employs over 80 million people, 80 million people. Florianópolis in Brazil took the lead and implemented an intelligent tourism project using applications that guide tourists when booking transportation and accommodation, monitoring their entire stay at points of interest, restaurants, attractions, and useful places until they finally return to their origin. And by doing this, they ensure safety, comfort, leisure, and well-being for the tourists. Oh. Next slide, please. The Colombian city of Medellin, the beautiful Colombian city of Medellin, once famous for being one of the most degraded and violent cities in the world, has put into operation a series of strategies to transform itself into a smart city, placing strategies focused on the citizens with projects to improve the quality of life that have developed the capacity and the organic structure of education, professional training, mobility, environment, and safety for the population, being today an example of success for all Latin America. Please get back to my screen, no slide, please. Thank you. So let's always keep this is in, in mind. Let's always keep this in mind. And without losing focus, a smart city is much more than a digital city and much different from a city with just hundreds of isolated electronic solutions. A smart city is a city where the solutions are interoperable and especially where the citizens participate and where they have an active voice in the collective decisions that promote a better quality uh, of life for everyone. And I thank you very much, Maria Alejandra, the microphone is yours. Thank you so much, Jorge. After this brief introduction, of course, uh, uh, it's the time to introduce the other panelists, but we are going to continue this discussion about all these aspects that uh, you just mentioned, and we're gonna be getting into, into all those details. But before that, I would like to introduce now Alvaro Porcuna, who is the advisor in your run strategies with 23 years of experience in 47 international projects. For his firm, uh, Ladibu Urban Tech, he leads the digital transformation of cities, areas of smart as well, supporting urban managers in the design and the implementation of innovation and transformation process. He's also co-founder of Anda Movilidad, a startup venture that is developing a digital payment solution in the public transport in countries with low bankerization rates through an innovative business model. 
Alvaro, if you would like to say hello to the audience, uh, this is the time to do that. But keep in mind that it's a brief hello. <laughs> just then, just hello. Thank you very much for the invitation, Maria Alejandra and, and Francisco. And very pleased to be here with Gregory and Dr. Barros. Um, um, and congratulate also Dr. Barros for this uh, astonishing um, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alvaro. Now, this is the time to introduce Gregory Engelbrecht. He's a board member of the Youth Tech Smart City Alliance section, and he is the founder and CEO of Engelbrecht Global Consulting, based in the Netherlands, partner and as well head of global sales at Radio Late International in Austria, Liechtenstein. Gregory has more than 15 years of professional international experience in project implementation and partnership management in Europe, US, and Latin America. What are more, he has keen interest in the smart city development and digitalization and in the wireless technology in particular. Indeed, with the increasing medical engineer and as well engineering management and quality management, Gregory brings a broad uh, perspective into smart city development and the future of wireless instructor and technology and applications. So now, Gregory, I will give you as well one minute to say hello to the audience and then we will, we're going to start the panel itself. Thank you, Maria Alejandra. Um, and likewise, I am uh, I'm happy to be part of this uh, this panel today, and thank you very much for the invitation to you and uh, Federico. And um, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, to the discussions today to, together with uh, Jorge and uh, and Alvaro. And um, yeah, let's uh, let's get started. Thank you, Gregory. So after these brief introductions from our uh, keynote speaker and from our panelists, I think that it's time to start with the first question. This question will be for all of you. And the question is, which are the main pillars of a smart city solutions in your opinion? Who would like to start? Alvaro, remember yeah. to unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't I couldn't hear the, 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 the question, please. Can you repeat yes. it, please? The question is, which are the main pillars of a smart city okay. solutions. Okay, I think um, now that I started, I subscribe every word that uh, Dr. Barrow said in his presentation, and I think there is the key to understand these pillars. But I think that interoperability is one of the main pillars of the of the smart cities. I mean, interoperability, interoperability, and management, and an appropriate management and known and capacity from the managers of the city. They have to understand that they can't operate in silos and they have to understand the power of data to manage better their cities. In Latin America, this is a, a problem because we have mega cities that are now unmanageable. So I think now the future resides in, on, on, on data and data that interoperate. That interoperate. I think that would be the main pillar. And also, I agree with, with you, Dr. Barros, in, in participation of the people, in the involvement of people at the time of uh, producing and planning in a smart city. Thank you, Alvaro. Please, Gregory. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, I also agree with, uh, with uh, what Alfredo mentioned and, and uh, what Dr. Barros uh, mentioned earlier. Um, I think it's important to to always keep in mind what the end result is, so what the objective is, and, and what the, what type of needs of the citizens you're trying to uh, to achieve, and that's why the involving the citizens is, is very important in, in building a smart city. Um, and at the same time, keeping uh, perspective of the the tools you need to build uh, the solutions, where I think uh, digital the digital aspect of it and the right infrastructure will be uh, key uh, parts as well, uh, but always uh prioritizing the the end result that you're searching which is uh creating a better uh um uh, better quality of life for for everybody for the whole ecosystem thank you gary jorge if you would like to add anything else to, to this point uh i think i will more or less say the same thing of my previous uh of the previous speakers of alvaro and, and gregory um i think that uh Technologically speaking, the main pillar of a good smart solution is interoperability and the citizens' participation. 
without these two main pillars, I don't think we can go anywhere. But from the point of view of um, finding out a proper environment to develop or the lever to develop a smart solution, I would say that it is creative economy. The creative economy is the main lever, is the place, is the ambience where we find uh, a good, uh, a, a, a fertile uh, field to develop our ideas. One of the main challenges of people who think and develop and concept the smart city solutions is to boost, is to promote an ambience where the creative in economy can be developed. That's the place where we find our creativity, not to go to the same roads, not to drive in the same roads we have driven before, and to find new solutions, creative solutions, innovative solutions for smart cities. Thank you, Jorge. Now, sometimes when we think about the smart cities, we think about the environment, we think about sustainability. My question would be, uh, do you think that technology in a smart cities is the key to sustainability? Okay, again, I start. <laughs> okay, yeah. with your permission, I think, uh, first of all, uh, the smart city has the ability to measure. If you don't have um, a quantification of the damages or, or a quantification of the causes, it's very difficult that you can uh, uh, that you can address the problem. So I think that's very very important at the beginning. Many cities are now implementing uh, detectors of, uh, of uh, um, pollution and noise, and that's because they want to enter into rankings in. In, in cities for investment. But actually what they're doing is just providing us information of our quality of life. And I think that's important because we have, as citizens, the, the, we are empowered to know, okay, we are living in a city that is providing us with a good air quality or a good ambience to, to live in. And also because to a smart city, you can also save energy and, and to measure and to quantify and to and to understand what are the real uh, demands for energy and what are the main sources of, of consumption of energy. And I think in these two ways, um, smart cities, of course, can help to, to alleviate or to uh, improve the environment of the, of, of the city. And those are also good pillar, pilot pillars to on, on which base uh, new creative solutions, as Dr. Barro said. Um, yes, so j just to change the, the line, to cross the line. <laughs> uh, I think that technology does, yes, have a lot of uh, applications to preserve, to maintain, uh, to, to boost sustainability, environmental, uh, environmental sustainability. But I do not think that technology is the main driver or uh, to or the main lever to invite to sustainability um i think that the main driver to sustainability is people awareness i do think that we need to promote uh, this awareness of the people through the, their participation in order to establish a real definition of what sustainability is. And let's not forget that environmental sustainability is the, the, main, um, the main thing that keeps us alive in the planet. So without sustainability, we don't even have life. 
and I do not think that technology is the main driver or the main lever for anything. I think that technology is a tool for a lot of things, but it's a tool that we use when it is necessary. I never put technology as the main focus of any thought, of any concept that we develop regarding smart cities. Thank you, Jorge. You are putting some spice here <laughs> in the conversation, but it's a really nice uh, point of view, yes. Uh, Gregory, would you like to add anything? I know that you yeah. have a close approach to technology, to wireless. Yeah. It will be interesting to, to see what you yeah. think about this. No, I mean, I totally agree with, uh, with Jorge. Yeah? Um, technology is a tool. And um, as Jorge mentioned, um, you have to use that technology wisely and in the right way. And I agree that with uh, in, in many cases, this is, um, I would say it's a lost opportunity because um, especially if you look at the municipality, for example, there's the municipalities have to deal with, with the budgets. They have, you know, there's so much they can do with the, with the different resources they have. And uh, when you don't give enough thought to the actual objective you're trying to achieve and you throw all your, um, let's say, all your funds into a certain technology, for example, then you, you cannot do all the other things you're supposed to be doing, right, to create this smart environment and ecosystem. So there has to be the, the thought process has to start more from what you're trying to achieve what's the overall goal, and then go back to the different parts you need. And technology is one of these. And in, in the different types of options of technologies you have, you have uh, also different um, possibilities you can create, which vary in terms of costs and vary in terms of, of the total possibilities you, you, you offer for innovation, for creating new solutions. And I think that's the right mix to give it. So uh, yeah, I, uh, I agree with, the, with what uh, Dr. Barros has said. Thank you, Gregory. I would like to ask you all, what are the main demands for digital transformation of cities in Latin America? So you, I will repeat the questions. Yes. What are the main demands for digital transformations of cities in Latin America? Well, um, okay, again, from my experience, and when you go to talk to majors in cities in Latin America or even governors, they are, um, I mean, there are very different uh, situations in different countries that come from um, Latin America. But m my experience has been security. Has been, I mean, they are, they are very concerned with security. They are very concerned with also um, uh, well, energy and lighting. These are the two main things that they really ask, but I think that um, they are focusing on just, you know, two silos or two things that are not uh, um, accomplishing the um, this criteria of interoperation. I think that the the, the demands are very uh, uh, narrow to their uh, situations right now, but they are. I think they are not looking actually to the future. I think energy consumption, I think the experience of the citizen, I think the involvement of people are more important in the future. But uh, mostly now they are asking for this, I mean, in, in my experience, but I think also they have a very, very, very big problem with transportation. Um, um, well, uh, this is a very broad question actually, but. I, th I think we can debate for this for <laughs> the rest of the hour. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Jorge and Gregory. Yes? Okay. Uh, I think there are a lot of demands in Latin America for the concept of smart cities. Uh, and I, ha I think we have to differentiate what, uh, what are the demands characterized as urgencies and priorities. Uh, I would say that the priority of any smart city solution is the education, education. But I think that the main urgency nowadays is security. However, Although I can list a lot of demands regarding mobility, health, 
a lot of other things, I would say that the main goal or the thing that is most important to perceive when we are formulating, developing a smart city is the capacity of the solution, the capacity of this project to create new jobs. I think that's the main demand. So we have the priority, which is, in my opinion, education. Education always come, comes as priority, as number one. We have the urgencies, and I think that the main urgency I don't know if it is only me, but I cannot hear you anymore. Jorge? Oh, hello. Are you still there? Yes. Are you? <laughs> Something happened on the way. <laughs> <laughs> but you are back. That's good. All right. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Hey, hello. I'm back. Yeah. Uh, so just, uh, ooh, just a second. something going on with my video okay i'm back right yeah uh, yes so summarizing there we have to differentiate the priorities the urgencies and the main concept or the main goal the main goal uh, i would say priority is always education education always comes first and then we have the urgency i think that nowadays we have a huge problem concerning security. However, I think that the main goal when we develop, when we concept a smart city project is the possibility or the capacity of creating new jobs. Thank you, Jorge. Gregory, would you like to add anything to this question or would you prefer if we proceed with another question? Um, yeah, I think um, I'd like to proceed with another question that both uh, Alvaro and, uh, and Dr. Baris have mentioned. Uh, I can cover it quite well. Yeah. No problem. The next question will be more about the challenges. And the audience already know that each one of you have experience inside Latin America. But more than that, you have experience abroad. So I would like to ask you about those challenges for the implementation of our smart cities. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about your experience. If you compare it with Latin America and US or Europe as you wish, who would like to start giving us that point of view? Uh, maybe I'll give it a go this time. Uh, I, I think I can touch on, on one aspect in any case where, where, where which is important, um, which is the, the connectivity, the basic connectivity of, uh, of the citizens. Um, you know, there's a lot of different priorities that uh, the government set uh, for things they want to achieve. Uh, when, when building a smart city and a smart economy, um, but a lot of this uh, starts as well with uh, with able to be connected um, to create this uh, let's say this equal playing field or equal opportunities for uh, for everyone, whether it's for education, whether it's for searching for jobs. Um, a lot of things uh, nowadays are digital, so that that basic uh, let's say that basic need um, that um, citizens have and that in future it will be more and more important to to be able to be connected. Uh, in, in whichever way, um, to be able to participate in the, in new developments, to be able to be part of the of the city that's evolving. I think that's one of the, the challenges that the cities have, how to bring this in a way that the city is influencing it and motivating it um, um, or, or uh, helping, uh, whether it's from private or from a city perspective, to introduce this. And if you look at uh, what happens in some of the countries abroad, I believe in Europe, um, there's still more, uh, there are more options um, and they're more open to creating options for everyone to connect, although it's quite well connected in many of the current countries in Europe. Um, uh, but if you look in the US, it's sometimes still a challenge because there's this dilemma in between what a municipality can do to help and, and, and create an environment for their citizens uh, versus what the, the private sector should be doing or what rights the private sector should, should have to, to, to be the one who's actually providing this. And this sometimes gives um, uh, some uh, strain 
or, or challenges in, in depending on which city you are. Um, Latin America is now evolving. Um, and uh, it's, uh, I think it's a great opportunity to have a look at this in, in the ways forward, how the cities can, can help um, make this this is better choices strategically to make sure that everybody is, is able to participate. Thank you, Gregory. Alvaro or Jorge. Okay. Um, well, I think the challenge in Latin America provides, well, maybe you can address this question from, from many points of view, but if you go to big cities and, and the immigration of that, that, that is coming to the, to the cities, um, I think they have a real problem of efficiency in the management of the, of the city. And I think there are two challenges to overcome. One is the, I think there is a need for integral planning, for any uh, planning that integrates um, uh, not only the needs for the management of the city, but also the needs of the people. I think the participative planning is very important. The second, the second challenge I think they have is also, is, well, it's obvious, is finance. I mean, many people ask me, how, how can you propose a smart city project when you don't have water in some neighborhoods, for, for example, how, 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 how can you address to that, that question? And well, the need is, is, is real, the need for water, for sanitation, for health, for education, for, but um, I think that uh, the infrastructures and equipments that the cities need uh, and that they need to implement right now are going to be uh, infrastructures and equipments that are equipped with the ability to capture and interpret data. So I think that, uh, and also I think that investing in smart city is um, less um, expensive than investing in new infrastructure and you can make a reuse of the infrastructure you already have if you use it more efficiently. More efficiently. And um, well, I, I think again the, <laughs> the question is very broad, so we could start, but we could speak about this for for hours. But I don't want to to take more time from Dr. Barros and and the rest of the panelists. Thank you, Alberto. Well, I think the main challenge that we have regarding smart cities in Latin America is to keep our uh, achievements to keep what we already have achieved. There is a wave, a threatening wave going on and dismantling the concept of smart cities through some bad examples that have been um, carried out in some cities in Latin America and outside Latin America. I just gave you the, the example of Canada, of Toronto and Canada and other cities in Canada are having the same problem. So I think the main challenge, uh, it's incredible, but I would say that today is to keep what we have already achieved, the gains that we already have. Another thing is, I, I'm very sad and worried when I see opinion makers, trend makers, going to the public and saying, for example, relating, for example, uh, laziness with uh, homeworking. Huh? What, what does it mean? It means that this person is a software developer, is a technology developer, and is putting his or her commercial interests ahead of the population. We know just a, just an example how much we have gained how much we have achieved so many good things avoiding traffic jams co emissions people jamming in the streets more leisure time more quality of life when through this epidemics that we had we learn how to work from home we learn how to operate home working and then a opinion maker, a trend maker comes in public worldwidely and says that homeworking is laziness. It's an absurd, it's outrageous. 
So it's another challenge uh, to keep focus on people's interests and not in commercial technological interests. Uh, and I would say that the third main challenge is to train people, is to um, empower people, especially the city managers, to know and to, to understand and to be in love with the smart city solutions. That's the only way we have to uh, enchant the community where we, where we are uh, working, where we are playing, where we are uh, broadcasting our inno innovative solutions and have their commitment to modern solutions, to new solutions. So these three challenges I would place as the main three ahead that we have in Latin America. Thank you, Jorge. Now I can see that we have really good questions and comments from the audience. I would like to start with a few, few of them. The first one will be from Lee Van Thor. He is saying, do smart city systems use data of the behavior of individual persons? And if so, how can privacy be insecure enough? Albert, I can see that you want to speak. <laughs> but you're on mute. No, 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 I, I will wait. I'm, I'm just enjoying this conversation very much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. I, I will save my opinion for later. Okay. Yeah. Gregory and Jorge, would you like to say anything in this regards? Well, um, I can say, uh, what, what I can say is, um, I think this is two different things, the smart city system um, and, and applications that run on a, on a system. Because um, if you look at, a, let's say from a technology perspective, right, um, a digital perspective, you have different layers in a city. So you can build the infrastructure um, to be able to communicate, to be able to connect. Um, and then you have the applications that this infrastructure is used for. And that is where um, I think this concern comes from when you have a city that, um, that has implementing now cameras. I think Dr. Barros mentioned an example where you use it without uh, consulting the, sit the, the citizens, without informing them what's exactly going on. Then you get this type of, uh, of concerns. Um, and this can be applied to any type of application that you're using on uh, your, uh, uh, within your, your environment or ecosystem of infrastructure. Um, to whether you're monitoring um, movements or sound or even temperatures and so on. So um, depending on the type of system you're using, uh, you could or you could not be uh, gathering more of a personal data. And this is where I think the role of the uh, municipality or of the government is important to, to have the right legislation in place to always be very clear on what type of information or data can be stored uh, or can be gathered uh, with these uh, applications. And, and how it's used. Um, let's say from my perspective, I believe that the most value will come from having an overall picture of what's happening in a city and then combining this data with other data you have to make smarter decisions and, and be less about uh, gathering personal information of specific persons. So, um, but that's also, of course, a, a responsibility of the, the, the applications that are being implemented and, uh, and obviously to make sure that you know, everybody tries to stick to the to the rules so that the citizens also feel comfortable with the different new uh, technologies they're implementing. Thank you, Gregory. Well, I think that we have to abide to this to the legislation. If uh, some countries and some cities do not have a robust legislation regarding uh, uh, private data. So it's more, it's past time to approve these legislations in order to protect our privacy, privacies. Um, uh, in Brazil, uh, this law was approved four years ago, only four years ago, but we, don't, but we cannot forget that for, for instance, uh, all these appliances that we have, all these platforms that we use, computers, uh, mobile phones, and others, 
they do invade our privacy all the time, all the time, without uh, respecting the legislation, because they collect things from public places without uh, really taking care of uh, whatever legislation is uh, in practice. But I think it's an important thing for some countries that have not yet developed the idea of having a proper uh, uh, data privacy legislation to do this. It's the only way to protect ourselves. Yeah, um, I would like to add on what you say. Uh, that, um, I quite agree, is that many um, I mean, the foundations of a smart city sometimes are, I mean, you need money to, to implement the smart cities, the uh, sensors and the smart city connect, uh, connectivity and uh, networks and, and all this stuff. But um, many, and in Latin America, uh, governments uh, are sometimes poor, so they don't have the money to do that. And they engage with uh, private companies to start pros, uh, projects of smart cities and there are uh, public private partnership. But there is the key point that they are financing these kind of projects with the property of data. And sometimes I think that the companies are using that as as a as as their I mean as the, as their revenue. The 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 property of individual data sometimes. And I think that this is a very important question because um, maybe if the companies doesn't have that incentive, it could be more difficult to implement a smart city projects that are based on technology, as uh, Dr. Barra said. Um, not all the smart cities projects are must to be based on technology. Technology is just a, a, a tool, but um, it can. I mean, we have a, a, a problem. We have an issue with that. Uh, when you when you propose projects in in Latin America cities, that you know companies want that. So, how do you overcome that? Thank you, Alvaro. Now, I would like to read one comment from Rolf. He's saying this. I think that the key of a smart city is to create an environment for people to thrive in the city have access to all their needs, quality of life as other states. All the technical details are important, but the most important is to improve the environment for the people. Would you like to say anything in this regards, Alvaro, Gregory, or Jorge? I think he uh, yes, summarized indeed what, what, what we've been saying, um, that the, 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 yeah, in the, end, the end goal is to, to serve the people. That's what uh, that's what the objective is and the the, um, the goal for for cities to make sure that the people who are in the city and the businesses can thrive and can can work and uh, so I think it's, a, it's a, for me it's a, I agree with uh, with the statement that's uh, in the end it's uh, it's for the people. Thank you, Gregory. Jorge or Alvaro, if you would like to add anything else. Yeah, it was beautifully. Uh, conceptualized this summarization. I think it reflects more or less everything that we have uh, transmitted until now in terms of uh, who are the ones who are really going to benefit from the smart city projects. When we think about smart cities, in, in who are we thinking about right? and who is going to benefit. It's, it was beautif beautifully uh, con uh, conceptualized, the summarization. It's precisely what, uh, what, what it should be, what it must be, and that's the only way to go, uh, to put people on the focus. Thank you, Jorge. Yeah, that, 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 that's right. I mean, nothing else to add. I think cities are about people, so smart cities are about smart citizens and empowered to the citizens to have the smart decisions and also to have a good environment to live in and how to make them possible to decide to decide or, or to act on on the environment of the city where they want to live there's nothing else to that thank you
Thank you, Alvaro. Now, the last question that I would like to ask you all is, uh, is regarding the phenomenon that we have after the pandemic. Many are trying to innovate. What will you say to all those entrepreneurs and business owners that are trying to offer a different solution or product for smart cities? I can see that you like this question. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah, I like, I love innovation, and I, I believe it's, uh, it's, uh, I say one of the key aspects of of building smart cities as well. I mean, the whole idea is that you come with new ideas, new solutions, um, to help improve the way things are done. So um, I think um, I, I try. I always look at it for a little from the let's say the technology aspect. Um, so um, yeah, for the entrepreneurs that are that are looking to develop new innovative solutions, as to to don't let existing uh, infrastructures limit your your product development. Uh, especially if you look at Latin America, you may not have all the latest technology at the moment, but there are other options. Uh, you can work, for example, in partnership with uh, newer or disruptive technology in, in other areas, whether it's in Europe, for example, or, or in the US, um, and start developing your solutions. Because at some point, they will come available in Latin America where you can then build your business. And at the same time, um, if you can develop something, whether it's in US or, or, or Europe, you have also a new market where you can also you know, use that development to start uh, generating your, uh, your business. Um, so I think that's, that's one uh, key element keeping in mind uh, Latin America, and uh, also looking at the new technologies. I mean, before we had only mobile technology, for example, in terms of connectivity and, and fiber. Now you have uh, low orbit satellites, you have uh, next generation uh, uh, mesh technology available. It enables you to do many more things, create many more solutions, uh, and come up with new ideas. Um, and I think, uh, again, here, collaboration um, will, be, will be key, uh, whether you're doing it together with a company within Latin America or outside of Latin America. And uh, that's important to keep the, the innovation going. So I think there's a, there's a nice, uh, nice future for, for all these innovation, innovative and, and innovators and entrepreneurs in, in Latin America as well. Thank you, Gregory. Who would like to go next? Salvador. Okay. I think, I mean, innovation, innovation is fostered by scarcity and crisis. And, and I think that the pandemic, uh, sadly, uh, has provided also a good an opportunity to to innovate now that we had to stay at home and that we had to you know to 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 remote doing everything i think that it proved that it could it could help and it's a, a good uh, environment to to innovate and i also think that now it has changed many minds and people is more open to innovation and more open to try and i think we have to um, take advantage of that opportunity uh, in latin america you won't find so many um, uh, support uh, or financial support for the for, for for your project or for your technology but i think that there is also an openness there because the the in Latin America there is this this need this urgent need to to improve and to and to improve their efficiency and I think that is a is a good environment to to test and and a good environment to try and and to develop. Thanks, Alvaro. Jorge. <clears throat> well. I think that the, the pandemics has taught a lot of things to, to us. One of the most important things was that we are able to create new things, to develop new solutions in order to meet our needs. So I want to refer back to the first concept I was talking about the creative economy creative economy for me is the main field is the fertile field where we can develop all new solutions where we can really innovate and let's remember that creative economy starts with a specific planning process it goes through other concepts, important concepts, as 
uh, intelligent education, the promotion of culture and um, professional education, it goes through compliance in the city management. Uh, it uh, presupposes the sharing, the knowledge sharing. We we have so we find it so difficult to share knowledge, especially in countries and in places where there is not a, a an adequate level of technological matureness. We have to reinvent the productive chains product for production chains. We have to boost the synergies, the synergies between the local businesses. And all of these are inserted in, in, a, in a, a broader uh, uh, environment, in a broader ambience called the studies of vocations and singularities. That's what creative economy is about. And I, I think that's the place we want, that's the university where we want to study. That's the place we want to go in order to really uh, take a step ahead to improve our cities inside the concept of the smart cities. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you so much to all of you for this uh suggestions these advices now before concluding today's event i would like to give the microphone to benedict who actually has a surprise for each of the panelists that join us on today's webinar uh, benedict the microphone is yours thank you very much maria for having me um my name is benedict Putz, and i'm vice president of the european senate of economy and technology uh, which is based in Brussels and on behalf of EU Tech and the European Senate, I'm very happy to present a small gift for you, dear panelists. Um, as you can imagine, climate protection is um, a huge topic for us, not only for uh, the goal of the United Nations, and uh, therefore we are very active. EU Tech and Senate uh, have an own climate action partnership, and I would like to thank you uh, on behalf of EOTEC and uh, the European Senate for your contribution to today's event. We really, really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, and here are tree certificates for you. So here with the European Technology Chamber confirms that a tree for Gregory, a tree for Avaro, and a tree for Jorge has been planted in Africa by our EOTEC Climate Action Partnership. So again, Thank you very much. I really appreciate this great panel of the Latin America Alliance. I think there are a lot of, a lot of points of, uh, to discuss about further. And uh, well, that was my, my short, uh, but uh, hopefully nice part. And now, ladies and gentlemen, have a great time. Thank you very much uh, for being here and for being our guest today. And I think the honor of the last, last words belongs to you, Maria. Thank you so much, Vic. Now, I would like to thank as well the audience for being here, for joining us. Uh, as Alvaro mentioned it in different occasions, this is something that we can discuss and discuss and discuss, and we can be here for hours and hours and hours. Uh, so for sure, this will not be the last meeting and digital event that we will have in these regards. I hope that the panelists will be joining us once again for another event. More than that, I would like to invite you to the conversation that we will have next week. It's going to be a networking meeting, and there the, the people that will participate will be able to put the camera, to turn out the microphone, so the dynamic will be different. The main idea of that, those meetings is to understand how we can join forces, how we can work together, who could be a partner, who could be a client, who knows? So I encourage you to join us. I'm going to be sending you more information about that, and feel free to reach me for any information regarding the chamber, but as well feel free to reach all the panelists, because if you would like to get deeper in what they do and how you can work with them, uh, it will be very nice if you can get in touch with each one of them. Otherwise, I won't be doing that much. So thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you so much to the audience. Uh, I wish you a great rest of the week. And remember the technology of Lighthouse. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you, Maria Alejandra. Thank you. All right. Bye, Jorge, Bye bye. Thanks for the invitation, Maria Alejandra. Thanks it was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.